today is our last week on uh, Elisha. Uh, we've been, uh, if you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we're studying um, the Old Testament prophet of Elisha. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And I'll be honest with you, the story that we're looking at today is one of those very obscure stories. It's not one of those stories that you learn, you know, uh, when you're a kid. At least, I, I mean, I never learned it um, when I was a kid. And, uh, but it's not one of the famous ones, you know, like David and Goliath or Moses opening up, opening up the Red Sea. This one is, in fact, when you read it, when we read it today, you're going to, you look at the story and it's like, okay, Lauren, why in the world did you put this thing here? Because it's, it's, almost, it's really hard to apply, and you, you look at it, and it's like, yeah, that doesn't really make sense a whole lot. This story, I guess maybe one of the reasons why I feel like that is it's sort of sandwiched between two great stories. The previous one, it's about um, Elisha and an, a man named Naaman. Uh, he was a Syrian commander. He was a man of authority. He was a military leader. And this guy had leprosy. And, um, and Elisha basically heals him, and I'm not doing the story any justice by just saying that. Uh, sometime, whenever you get a chance, uh, go into 2 Kings chapter 5, and you can look at it on your own. But it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible story of faith. And then the story that comes after the scripture that we're going to look at today, it's another great story. Elisha is with his servant. There's an army that's coming after them. They're trying to kill them. And uh, essentially, I mean, they're all over the place, all over the place. And Elisha prays up to the Lord, and, and God, is, what he does is he blinds the army. He blinds his army, completely blinds them, and uh, gives them, gives them uh, victory and uh, provides for them deliverance. And so you have an amazing story before, and then another incredible story after, and in between you have seven verses. And when you read them, you're like... Okay, great, so what? what? What are you trying to tell me now, Lord? And I hope, that, um, I hope that you get something out of the message today. Now, the Bible does say that all Scripture is God-breathed. And I've talked to you, we've actually did a whole study on this, on this verse, um, how this is not just uh, an inspiring book, and it can inspire you, definitely can challenge you and it can, it can inspire you, but it's not like just a bunch of writers that were just inspired and then just gave you God's word. And this is, when the Bible, this is the very words of God. They're, they're, this is the very breath of God. And, and what, I, what we've said is that, um, you know, if you put, if you were to say something out loud or if you were to read something out loud and you put your fingers on your lips, you can actually feel that breath coming out. And essentially what my voice is, is that. It's breath that basically goes over my vocal cords and it vibrates those and it comes out as a sound. And that's sort of what this is. These are the very words of God. That's why God says, oh, Scripture, another translation says it's all inspired. Okay, it's the very words of God. And so the verses that we're going to look at today, they're, they're coming from God's word himself, from his mouth himself. And I believe it's a God-given story. So what I want to do this morning is this, I want to give you the context, okay, just kind of let you know what's going on, and then we're going to look at our scriptures, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at a couple of points that we can apply for, for our lives, all right? So number one, the first thing that we've been saying is that Elijah, not Elisha, but Elijah, is the prophet who comes before Elisha, and he's usually the one that gets all of the attention, I mean, Elijah was all about the fireworks. I mean, the guy, he would call fire from heaven, and there's this story where literally he calls fire from heaven and I think he, he, he says a, a 63 word prayer and fire comes down. I mean, lightning just uh, uh, light, it lights up the sky, you know, it burns the altar, the water is all, um, it, it all, it's all consumed. And then he goes and he goes after like 400 prophets of Baal. I mean, Elisha was this guy that every miracle was like explosive. That's Elijah. Um, when the, the land uh, was, uh, when there was no food in the land, Elijah, Elijah, and sometimes I get him confused, I'm trying to make sure I, I don't get him confused, Elijah was actually fed by ravens. 
Okay? There was no food in the land, and the Bible tells us that birds would come, and they would drop food right next to Elijah. Elisha, the one that we're studying today, is a, is a different kind of prophet, um, uh, and we sort of have a tendency to ignore him. But his ministry was, I think it was actually twice as long, I think it was like 45 plus years. Uh, Elisha actually... We have more recorded um, miracles from Elisha in Scripture than anybody else, except for the exception of Jesus Christ. And um, he ministered not only to the Israelites, but also to the, their leaders, not just, not just to the people of Israel, but to the leaders. So Elisha is different. His miracles were not like fire and brimstone sort of miracles, but he was a capable leader, leader and he was just an unbelievable man. Um, and hopefully you've seen that a little bit this week. And so one of the things that Elisha is going to do, he's going to invest his time in this school. Okay, it's a school of prophets. All right, and I guess what it is, it's it's kind of like a seminary school. If you if you um, study the Bible, you know that the nation of Israel they had ups and downs all the time spiritually, just kind of like you and I. And, um, and so Elisha said, you know what, I'm going to invest my time into this school that's going to encourage spiritual leaders, okay? And so the story that we're going to be looking at, at today has a little bit to do with that. And um, so he had a, a bunch of young guys under him. Basically, he was mentoring them. And um, they had three locations. They had three of these schools. One was at Gilgal, the, the other one was at Bethel, and the other one was in Jericho. And, um, and you had all these young men training to take God's message to the people. And in one of these locations, the Bible doesn't say which one in particular, but in one of these locations, they were running out of space. Good problem to have. I mean, they were packed. There were so many young people in there that they didn't know where to put them. And so they come to Elisha, a prophet that we're looking at today, and they say, look, We've got to build a new building. We've got to come up with another location because we just don't have any more space. Okay? So everybody tracking so far? Are you with me? Hopefully I haven't lost you yet. And uh, this is what the Bible says. Verse, uh, we're going to look at chapter 6, verse 1. So here it is. It says, The company of prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is what? It's too... Small. It's too small for us. We just don't have enough, enough space. Let us go to the Jordan, prime location. Waterfront view. I mean, this is the best, beautiful place. They want to they take this place, the best place they can take it. Let's just go to the Jordan. Let's just build another location, another campus over there. It says, um, verse 2, it says, uh, Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live and he said, let's all say that last word together. He said, go. go. That's what I like about Elisha. Elisha was this guy that was, uh, he was always propelling people forward. Always encouraging people to move to the next step. And he says, go for it. All right. I mean, there, he could have said no. He could have said, well, it's too expensive. I mean, what are you thinking? You know, remember, we'll change the time. No, no. He said, let, you want to build another? Let's go. Verse 3. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? And he says, Elijah says, I will. Now remember, this man, he said, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather be with them than just necessarily preach with them. So this, he was mentoring them. And so they come, come on, Elijah, would you come with us? Would you come with us? He says, sure, I'm, I, I will go. And he's probably thinking, you know what? I'm going to, this is a good chance for me to hang out with them with all of his seminary students, and I'm going to hang out with them, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mentor them, I'm going to talk to them, and who knows what will happen? Who knows what I can tell them? Who knows how, what I can teach them? Verse 4 says that he went with them, and they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. So they're cutting all these trees down um, to build the building. Now, don't miss this, okay? Verse 5. As one of them was cutting down a tree... It says, the iron axe head, the stool that this guy's holding, fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was what? It was borrowed. Yeah. So I, I want you to, this may be a little hard for you to think about, you know, but I just want you to picture this for a minute. 
you have this young guy, probably a, a you know, young prophet guy, and he loses his axe head, okay? And he's probably very, he's probably, my guess is probably doesn't have a whole lot of money. You know how college students are, right? They're always um, asking for money. They're, you know, it's a student loan or, you know, what, what do they usually eat, college students? Ramen noodles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're always, they're always needing something and they don't have it and they're borrowing things. And so that was the case right here. Always borrowing a ride or a book or a computer or a printer, you know, or a toothbrush or whatever. I, I never went that far, but... Um, <laughs> And so this guy had borrowed this axe head and takes it over there. And this guy, the Bible says, that he's chopping away. Bang, 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 cutting all these trees. And he's excited, okay, because Elisha was, was one of those leaders that would propel people forward. And all of a sudden, the, the axe head um, goes, splash. Now, do that again, but I don't want to blow you away with my sound effects, all right? <laughs> so he's chopping at the tree, and the, the thing, the axe head just goes into the Jordan River. And it's like, oh, no, I borrowed this thing. This is not mine. And you're probably thinking, eh, what, what's the big deal? I don't, I don't know if you've ever borrowed something and you have broken it. Has anybody ever done that? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Yeah, some of you have done that. Have you ever borrowed a, a, a car and wrecked it? Anybody like that? Anybody who's willing to admit that? Some of you guys don't want to raise your hand. Yeah, not a good day, right? Sometimes you let me borrow books or things, and I'm always afraid. Oh, man, I'm going to lose this thing. I'm not going to... You know, and, um, and so you're probably thinking, well, it's just an accent. I mean, it's just an axe. What's the big deal, you know? Well, put yourself in that environment, in that culture. It wasn't like they could go to Walmart and get an axe, right? And um, tools back in that day, I mean, they were very hard to come by. And by the way, anything that was either metal or instruments or weapons or anything like that were extremely, extremely expensive. And... Um, and so this thing, uh, most tools, by the way, they were made out of bronze, and, uh, which is not as good as, what was, this, what was this axe head made out of? You guys picked up on that? Made out of what? Iron. Iron, yeah. And so on top of all that, the law says if you borrow something and you don't return it, the consequences are extreme. The consequences are devastating, all right? Eventually, essentially, you could actually become a slave to this whoever um, whoever let you borrow this thing. Remember last week we were talking about the widow um, who lost her husband and this guy came to get her in debt. She had this debt. She couldn't pay it. And essentially the guy was coming to take her two sons as slaves. That's how big of a deal that this scenario is. Now, you also have the Jordan River. Now, I don't know how many of you were taking a trip to Israel next year. I don't know how many of you have actually seen the Jordan River, but it's not the Virgin Islands, okay? So it's not like you can... Uh, you can see the bottom, bottom of the ocean or the, you know, see the shell or your feet, you know. The, the Jordan River is muddy, it is nasty, it's deep, it's fast. And so if I would have been this guy, man, I would have been like, oh no, I'm, gonna, I'm in trouble. I'm going to be a slave to this guy for a couple of years until I pay my debt. Elijah actually here's where um, he gets to do something pretty amazing because he's spending time with them because it, it would have been very easy for Elijah to say you know what you guys just go right ahead I'll just stay behind but here's where true mentoring happens okay he's just doing something ordinary with them just hanging out with them this guy loses his, the axe head to his axe and Elijah sees it in his verse 6 watch what, what happens so it says the man of God asked where did it fall where, where did it go? And, and so the, the, the young prophet guy, probably the young seminary guy, said, I heard the splash over there, whatever. And when he showed him the place, Elisha, watch this, don't miss this, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in there and made the what? Float. Made the iron float. So he cuts his stick, throws it in the water, and this thing this, that probably has some considerable weight Float, okay? Now, you're probably thinking, well, if it would have been Eli Elijah, you know, he would have prayed some massive prayer and a fish would have come out of the water with the axe head on his mouth and handle, handle it to the guy. That would have been Elijah. Elijah, not so cool, not so, you know, fireworks. Elijah was just like, you know, just cuts a stick, throws it in there, it floats, okay? Now, if I have not lost you by now, you're probably thinking, all right, Pastor Alex, I agree with you. I have no idea what this story is about. 
okay? I have no, what is this all about? What, why would God put something like this in the scripture? What is the point? Two things that I want to go over with you. Um, believe it or not, this is a very short message. I actually cut it down just a little bit just for you guys. Two points, two points that I want you to um, take away today. I want you to go home with. Number one, God provides for his children through unusual means. God provides for his children through unusual means. It doesn't have to, it, it doesn't always have to be fireworks, okay, for God to provide for you. A while back, I watched this man um, win the lottery. I think it's New York lottery or something like that. And it was several hundred million dollars. And I had one of those thoughts. Have you ever had them? Oh, man. I just, you know, it was like, I don't know, like 100, 300 million dollars, okay? And I'm watching this guy on the news or whatever. And I'm thinking, oh, imagine what I could do with that. Imagine all the things we could do here around the church. And anybody... Anybody ever had that thought? Raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, just a few of you guys. Not, it just probably just me, but, you know, I'm kind of a heathen, so, you know. So I'm thinking, oh, you know, this would be great. And then God just convicted me. He said, you know what? You have a beautiful family. You know, you have an amazing church. You have your health. You have clothes. You're wearing clothes right now. And as I'm, I'm thinking of the million dollars, you know, God has convicted me. Okay, he's saying, you know what? You can't pay for any of those things. So, you know what? I'm blessing you way more, way beyond what this guy may maybe have. And now I thought, you know what? Um, God, sometimes God provides for us in ways which we, we can't uh, imagine. Now in, verse, in Psalm 139, the Bible says this. I love how King David puts this. He says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and, know, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. I want you to think about that for a moment. You are familiar with all my ways. Nothing escapes God. You have, you have a big, big God who cares about the details, the small details of your life. So, so you have a headache, and you're having one of those days, and it's like, oh, no, God cares about that. Your car, it won't start up again in the morning. God cares about that. You have a chemistry test coming up or some sort of test coming up. God cares about those things. Uh, uh, you're, you're on the phone and, and you're, um, you're looking for your phone. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been on the phone and you're actually looking for your phone? I did that the other day. You know, it's like, I have lost my phone. I'm talking to this person. I have lost my phone. I don't know where it is. I'm, I was supposed to be looking something on my calendar, right, which is on my phone too. And I'm like, I don't know where my phone is. God, help me out. God may be laughing at you, but he cares about those things. You know, he says to you and me, he says, you know what? Do not be anxious. I love this verse. Don't be anxious. In other words, don't, don't be fearful. Don't be um, afraid about anything. But in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So what's the point of this whole story? Number one, God provides for us, sometimes through unusual means, sometimes... We don't even realize how God is providing for us. And we go through things in life, and, we're, and usually what we see is what we don't have, right? When we're down, and we're desperate, and we're discouraged, all we see is what we don't have. And it's those times that God is providing for you the most, saying, you know what, I am here for you. Here's the second point that I, that I got from this story. When God provides an open door, he expects you to go through um, go through it. When God provides an open door, he expects you to go through it. Look at verse 6 one more time. Elisha cut a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. Verse 7, watch this. Don't miss this, okay? This is important. We're almost done. Lift it out, he said. Elisha says, lift it out. And then the man, let's, let's read that last phrase together. All together in unison, the man reached out his hand and took it. Now, imagine this whole story without that last line right here. It was still a pretty incredible miracle, right? I mean, Elisha made this axe head flow. That's pretty cool. But imagine this whole story for that man. That man would have been left unchanged. Without that last line, that man would have still had a debt. 
to pay. He probably would have still had to go and be a slave. But God provides a way, and he says, now it's your turn. Pick it up. So this is what the whole, and I come, kind of come to the last message on Elisha, and this is what the whole series has been about. There are some things that only God can do, but there are other things that only you can do. Remember, that I think the first week we said, uh, only God can provide for the water, but he wants you to grab a shovel and dig some ditches. Remember? You know, uh, we said, only God, only God can multiply the oil. Remember the, 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 the widow, right? And she said, and the prophet Elisha comes to her and says, what do you have in your house? And she says, nothing, I don't have anything, right? Because you don't have anything. Well, all I have is just a little bit of oil. Bingo, that's, what, that's all God needs. Whatever you have, no matter how small it is, that's what God needs. See, God can provide, he can multiply the oil, but you got to get some empty, vest, uh, some empty jar, jars. And the same with this story. God can make this exit float. But it's up to you and I to pick it up. So how about you? Do you need to be reminded that he cares today? That he provides for you through unusual means, even when you don't understand, even when things are not going your way? Do you need a reminder that um, sometimes God opens up some doors and he wants you to go through those doors? Let me close by saying this. If you don't get anything else, I hope you get this one thing. Um... This is what amazes me about this story. God used Elisha and a piece of wood, it was just a stick, to raise this axe head so that this man would have no, no debt. And through Christ and another piece of wood, we call it the cross, right? God raised a resurrected Jesus so that you and I would not have to pay the debt of sin. But it's up to you and it's up to me whether we're going to pick it up or not. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment. I don't know how God's speaking to you today. I don't know if there's a door in your life that you have to go through right now. And God is saying, okay, pick it up. All right, I've done, I've done the miracle. I've opened the doors, but it's up to you right now. I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know if, there's, if you have been frustrated the last few days because things just don't go your way. And maybe what God is saying to you is, you know what? I'm going to provide, but it's not going to be your way. I'm going to provide for you, but it's, it's going to be a little different. Sometimes I provide for my children through unusual means. If you want to see the power of God in your life, go through those doors. If you've never given your life to Christ, this is a perfect time to do it. I encourage you to, to give your life to Him. It's not about a religion, it's not, not about becoming a Baptist. It's not about a, a, um, a list of things that you have to do. It's about giving your life to Christ. Only God can do the miracle. But you have to do your part. In a minute, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you want to join our church, this is a perfect time to do it. If you want to give your life to Christ, or maybe you want to bring something to the altar and just lay it at the altar. Um, whatever it is that God is telling you to do, I pray that you would just take the, the time do it. Father God, thank you for Elisha. Thank you that it wasn't always fireworks for him. You used him, Father, in the mundane and the ordinary. And Father, that's how we, you often use us. He was available, Father. He was serving you 24-7. God, I pray that we, would, um, that we would learn that from this man. God, we thank you for for your forgiveness and for your grace. Father, I pray that if one here today who's, who needs you, who needs of that forgiveness, I, I pray that they come to you, Lord. There's one who is tired, they feel like they're free falling, they feel like they're at the end of their rope. Father, I pray that you would meet their needs. Father, fill them up with your spirit. 
God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your uh, unconditional love for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.